All right. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Asile. I am here with the Center for Civic Innovation, and welcome to Dollars and Cents, Understanding Local Government Budgets. Um, this is our second series um, episode in the series of the Social Studies event, and I am joined by our, my partner in rhyming names, Kyle. Hey, Kyle. How's it going? Hey, Asile. Thanks for kicking us off. Yes, no problem. So um, I want to first, before we get started, um, give a little primer on the Center for Civic Innovation and what we do. And then we are going to dig right into the budgets and talk about why they're important and how you can use them. All right. As I mentioned, welcome to Dollars and Cents. Um, so first off, I'm going to give a little bit of background on the Center for Civic Innovation. So what we do, we're an organization based in Atlanta, Georgia, and our main function is uniting people who are fighting to end social and economic inequality in Atlanta. As we know, those inequalities manifest in multiple ways. And what we want to do is inspire people to take action, invest in ideas that are looking to solve the problems, and advocate for policy change from the ground up. And this social studies series is a huge part of that because what we want to do is highlight the importance of civic engagement in the city of Atlanta. As we know, the things that are built for us without us are not actually for us. And what we want to encourage is people being engaged in their civic processes. And in order to do that, we have to have the nuts and bolts on what those civic engagement processes are. And here we are today talking about one of the biggest ways that you can get involved and one of the biggest functions of the way that decisions are made within the city of Atlanta and in other government entities, which is the budget. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, understanding local government budgets and how they work. So you all had a little entry quiz that wasn't really a quiz at the beginning. So we're gonna talk about that and just get a primer on the results just so we have a better understanding of who's in the room and who's in the audience. And then we're gonna break down some important terms and definitions to know. And then we're gonna get right into it, thinking about where your money goes, how that money is being spent, and how you can have a decision-making power and impacting that spending. And then we're gonna kick it over to subject matter experts themselves with Alex from the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute and Jennifer Ide from the city of Atlanta. So we're gonna start with this primer. Um, if you have any questions, there's a and a function there that we'll be able to answer as we go along within the panel conversation. Um, so hold your questions and get ready to take notes because we're gonna get started. So first off, we have the results from the survey. So let's see what you guys said. Kyle, do you want to kick it off? Yeah, so what we're seeing is that most of y'all um, are here from the city of Atlanta, but we have some folks from Fulton and DeKalb County elsewhere, and some people that uh, live much further afield. So welcome to our Zoom call this afternoon. Um, also, question number two, um, how much do people know about local government? Uh, some people know a little, some people know a lot, and some people don't know anything. So hopefully those answers will change through the course of this presentation and people will learn um, a lot or maybe they'll learn everything. Maybe not everything, but a lot of stuff about the budget. We'll try. Yep. And then what are we seeing? What people want to spend more money on? Uh, lots of people want to spend more money on education, on housing and healthcare. We'll talk about those things. And people are interested in less money on, um, a little on less housing, but mainly less on the police. So that'll definitely come up in the conversation as well. So thanks for taking that quick little quiz. And let's get started with the rest of the presentation. All right. So before we dig into the numbers, what we wanted to make sure we do for the people that are, don't necessarily know that much about budgets and how they work is equip you with the terms and important words that you're going to be needing to know about. So that way, when you hear budget conversations or you're calling in for a public comment or whatever the case may be in order to get involved, you want to be equipped with these words and definitions so that way you know what we're talking about when we're talking about budgets and the things that go into them. So get ready to take notes if that's something that's of interest to you. And what we're going to do is t talk about obviously the budget along with fiscal years, budget cycles, funds, etc. So let's start with the thing that we're all here for, which is what is a budget? 
So um, the budget is a budget is a document that's prepared by a government entity like MARTA, the city of Atlanta, the Atlanta Housing Authority, et cetera. And what it does is it presents the anticipated revenue, so the money that's going to be gained, and the proposed spending for the coming fiscal year. So that's a pretty straightforward definition. Um, there are different budgets for different entities, which we'll get to in a second. But the main thing that the budget captures is what money is coming in, what money is going out for a particular fiscal year. But what is a fiscal year? What are we talking about? So a fiscal year is different from a calendar year in that it doesn't necessarily start from January to December all the time. But what it is is a 12-month period that governments are able to use for financial reporting and budgeting purposes. For today, we are going to be primarily focused on the city of Atlanta and the Atlanta public schools budgets. But with the help of our panelists, we're going to dig into the state of Georgia and other entities that are important to us. So as I mentioned, we're talking today about the budget cycle and the fiscal year that's happening between July 1st, which is right around the corner, and June 30th of 2021. With that, what is a budget cycle? So the budget cycle is the process and timeline that these government entities are going through to create and approve their budgets. So there are two main phases that go on within that. There's an internal process of the budget, and those are the closed door interactions that are happening to get data collection, the planning processes and things like that. And then from there, go from the internal process to the public process. So this is where you hear the public presentations on the budget. This is when public hearings and public comment come in. And all of this is preparation work to be able to approve the budget at the beginning of the next fiscal year that is coming up. So these are the two main things that are happening in the process to create and ultimately approve the budget. One thing that I do want to note is at the end of a budget cycle, that doesn't mean that the budget is necessarily stapled together and finalized forever. There are amendments that happen throughout the fiscal year, which is important to know if you're looking to get involved in the budget and figure out how to change it for an issue that is important to you. And that's what we want to be able to equip you with today. Up next, we have things that are called funds. So what these are are fiscal entities with a self-balancing set of accounts. And what that basically means is these are set up to accomplish specific activities or accomplish certain objectives in accordance with things. Um, what we're going to be talking about is things that local governments have, which is called a general fund. And that's going to be the most flexible fund that is used to really reflect the needs of people and communities that are being affected. There are more specific funds as well, and restricted funds, and an example of that would be the airport that has their own separate thing. But generally speaking, we're going to be talking about general funds with a little bit of help from the other funds as well. Up next, we have different types of budgets. So the main two that we're going to be talking about is operating budgets, which cover the day-to-day -day expenses that we understand in, the, in our day-to-day -day lives, things like office supplies, utilities, employee wages. And what's important to note about these is these return year after year. And these are the day-to-day -day expenses required to deliver these services to, to their residents. This is different from a capital budget, which is used for more of a long-term investment, things like infrastructure, things like road construction. We don't want things like road construction to be in operating budgets because those change pretty frequently, and we don't want to decide this year we're building a road, and then that's something that just pops up. Those capital budgets are used for more long-term investments, and those take more multiple years to process. So with the things that people are interested about on the Zoom call today, we're going to be mainly talking about the operating budget, which encompasses those day-to-day -day expenses that we experience in our everyday lives. And up next, we have revenue and expenses. These are pretty straightforward, but revenue is the money that is received by local governments to be able to pursue their operations and what they're trying to build. These are taxes, fees, other receipts collected. This is what is being received in order to pursue what the goals are of the budget. Whereas expenses are what is being spent. So this includes employee salaries and benefits. Um, one thing that's important to note about the difference between these two is local governments typically have to get their revenue and expenses to match, right? The amount of money that's coming in should be the exact amount of money that's going out, i.e. balancing your budget. So in good years, money is being put into a reserve fund, so that way they have that extra money just in case. 
And in bad years, money is being taken out of that reserve fund to be able to balance it. So if the work is being done right, everything is balanced and everything checks out. But in an event such as the COVID pandemic, for example, there are going to have to be some tweaks and some adjustments to be able to balance out the expenses and the money that we're receiving. So that's an important thing to note. But the budgets that we're going to be showing you today have an equal amount for revenue and expenses. And you'll see that little balance in the middle that weighs the scale a little bit to make sure that those numbers are equal. And the final thing that we all love so dearly is taxes and fees. So taxes that we're familiar with every day are means to raise money to be used for these governmental purposes and to add to that revenue bucket that's being able to spend. Um, Whereas fees are other charges that are imposed for a specific person or a specific activity. We're going to dig into where this money is being spent and what that entails. And taxes are going to play a big role, may I mean a big role, in how these expenses are being budgeted out. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kyle, who's going to talk about what a lot of us are here for today, which is who gets what money and where it comes from. Kyle, off to you. Thanks, Lasalle. You leave me the fun part to talk about taxes. Um, so as you can see on this slide, we have a lot of different government entities and we have a lot of different sources of taxes coming in. Um, some of these like income tax come out of your paycheck. Um, some of them, if you're a city of Atlanta resident or uh, live in the state of Georgia, you probably just got a tax bill or a tax assessment notice, which will lead to a tax bill on your property tax coming up. But people also have to pay for you know motor vehicle tax, um, sales tax on the goods and services you buy at the grocery store or when you're out shopping. Um, we also have things like excise taxes that are taxes on gasoline or taxes on um, uh, cigarettes or alcohol. Um, and those things you often don't necessarily see just as much because those taxes uh, aren't collected by the end user, they're collected by an intermediary along the way. And then each of those taxes goes to a different body and they're used for different things. And as we will talk more about the city of Atlanta and Atlanta public schools in the state of Georgia, you can see here just some of the many things that they spend their money on. But the two things that uh, are probably most uh, relevant to local government budgets here are the property taxes and the sales taxes. We'll start off with the sales tax because that's something that we easily see on a day-to-day -day basis. So in the city of Atlanta, uh, for every dollar that you spend, uh, there is 8.9 cents in taxes that are applied to that. Much of that money goes to the state. Uh, the state has been collecting sales tax since 1951. And back then it was just three cents, but uh, over time it's increased to four cents per dollar. Now these taxes that are addition to the state sales tax are all voted on locally to make sure that people want to be taxed on these things and to make sure that we're getting good value out of uh, what the money is going towards. So one of those that's on there is uh, 1.5 cents for MARTA. Um, that was originally one cent, but it's been increased to 1.5 cents for the more MARTA tax. Uh, but that goes to help pay for public transportation um, in the city of Atlanta and other jurisdictions have also taxed themselves to provide MARTA in the rest of Fulton County, DeKalb County, and Clayton County. Now lost, that's something uh, that might be a little bit more difficult to decipher is the local option sales tax. Um, which was designed to offset property taxes. And as we get into a breakdown of each of the budgets, we'll see how that plays out um, as a property tax reduction. We have the municipal option sales tax, which city of Atlanta residents just voted to renew, uh, which helps go to pay for water and sewer upgrades. Uh, then we have the East Blast or the educational special purple, special purpose local option sales tax. Each of these is a tongue twister. Um, which helps pay for school construction and covers capital costs, not operating cost. And then we have the t a transportation tax exclusive to the city of Atlanta um, that weighs in at 0.4 cents for every dollar. So that's sales taxes, but as you might know, if you are a property owner, um, we also have property taxes here in the city of Atlanta. So for property tax dollars, uh, for every dollar you pay in property tax, about 50% of that goes to the Atlanta public school system. About a quarter of it goes to either Fulton or DeKalb County, depending upon where you live. And then the other quarter goes to the city of Atlanta. And as you can see here, portions of that quarter amount um, are broken out into different uh, funds to pay for bonds and to pay for parks. Now we can't give you exact numbers on how much of uh, your property tax goes to each of these entities. One, because as you can see on the slide, this is from the 2019 Tax Digest. Uh, our counties are still working through the 2020 Tax Digest. Um, and if you've got a tax assessment notice, there's an opportunity to appeal. 
And then based upon your personal circumstances as well, uh, whether you have homestead exemption, whether you're a senior, whether you're a veteran or disabled, there might be opportunities to lower your tax bill from some of these entities as well. So uh, we are about to get into how our governments are spending our money. So now that we know sort of how it's coming in, we need to figure out where that money is gonna go. This is what you all are waiting for, right? Um, so first off, we'll start with the city of Atlanta. Um, so just some quick statistics uh, for those of you who maybe don't live in the city of Atlanta, but want some understanding of uh, how the city of Atlanta is spending its money. Um, we have two numbers that are here. One, about half a million people who live in the city of Atlanta um, call it home every night. Um, but during the daytime, at least pre-COVID, the population would swell as more people would come in to work um, in the city of Atlanta. So the daytime population is much larger than the, uh, the evening, the residential full-time population for the city. So anybody have a guess as to uh, what the budget is for the city of Atlanta, how big a dollar figure that is? Well, unfortunately, you're all muted, so I can't uh, hear your answers. But for the 2021 budget that just was passed, uh, it's about $673 million just in the general fund. So once again, that's a really flexible pot of money that we can choose year to year how we want to allocate that. And that works out to roughly $1,300 per resident in the city of Atlanta. So as a solid mentioned, we have different funds. Um, so here's a key sort of chart showing the breakout of different funds that the city of Atlanta uses to differentiate its money. Uh, we'll mainly be talking about the general fund, uh, but there are other funds that are available here, um, such as the t -Sploss, which we mentioned, uh, and the special 0.4 cents that goes to it. Um, a few of those really big ticket items in the city of Atlanta, um, the Atlanta airport has its own fund, so we'll not be talking about it, but we'll share a little bit more information about it, as well as the solid waste and wastewater and sewer. So every time you get a water bill or every time uh, they pick up your trash, there's a separate sort of accounting process to go for that. Um, that money is difficult to relocate uh, to spend for anything else because it's a dedicated source and in an enterprise fund. So just to get a sense of the magnitude of these budgets, we're gonna show you what they look like on this next slide. So here's the overall breakdown of the city budget. So overall, it's $2.2 billion, uh, but we're focusing on that $673 million, which is the general fund. And as you can see, the airport revenue fund is basically the same size as the general fund, but all that money comes from the airport and stays at the airport. Likewise, with those other funds, they can't really shift back and forth too easily to the general fund uh, based upon restrictions that were put in place when they were created. So let's dive a little deeper into the general fund and find out where that money is coming from and where it's going. So first up, uh, where the money's coming from, where the revenue's coming in. Uh, you can see that most of the money's coming in from property taxes. Um, and that's probably what you'd suspect based upon 25% of your property tax bill going to the city of Atlanta. Um, another chunk, 15.6% or so, comes from license and permits. Um, so this includes things like um, alcohol licenses, business licenses, uh, building permits, those things. Uh, but another sizable chunk is the local option sales tax. You remember back on that earlier slide um, with the penny breakdown, the local option sales tax or lost was to offset property taxes. So you can see here if, uh, if we didn't have that local option sales tax and the property tax portion of the bill would have to go up 15% roughly to make sure that we cover all the funds uh, that are necessary to cover the city's budget. Um, but you'll notice here too, um, as Asal mentioned, uh, when there are certain years like with a COVID crisis or something else and revenue is down, um, we'll often draw upon that existing fund balance to make sure that the budget is balanced. Um, so we don't have to cut services as much um, if we wanted to reduce the overall budget. So let's see where the money goes. So here in the city of Atlanta, roughly a third of the overall budget goes to fund the police. Um, so that co co cost covers personnel, it covers their vehicles, it covers their equipment, their cameras, uh, it covers their uniforms. Um, everything that's associated with the police um, is here in this particular piece of the budget. Um, fire comes in at number two, um, with roughly 14% of the budget. Um, and then you got another sizable chunk, which is non-departmental. Um, that is a fairly large sort of catch-all, um, but lots of that portion of the budget goes to pay for existing debts and, and other things that aren't easily broken out or assigned to just one piece of the budget. Um, but you can see there on the right-hand side a further breakdown of various departments um, and offices in the city of Atlanta and where that money goes. One thing that I'll note on this slide um, is, as Sal mentioned before, these budgets are constantly sort of evolving and adjusting. 
Um, so when the budget was originally proposed, uh, there was 2.8% that was going to go to fund corrections, uh, mainly the city jail. Um, after the introduction of the budget, there was an amendment proposed, or there was discussion about an amendment, which would move 13.5 million out of the roughly 18 and a half million of that money from the Department of Corrections to constituent services to pay for social services. And we'll talk about some of that more with our panelists. I'm gonna pitch it back to Asada to talk about some of the other highlights in this year's City of Atlanta budget. Thank you, Kyle. So um, as Kyle mentioned, um, or as I mentioned earlier, actually, the budget goes from July 1st to June 30th or 31st of, I don't know, the June to July dates of 2021. Um, and here's some of the changes that we're gonna see as reflected in the budget conversations that have been happening. So first and foremost, there'll be no increase in the city of Atlanta's mileage rate for property taxes. So if the value of your property has not gone up, neither will your taxes, which is a good thing for some property owners. Um, one of the things that I also want to mention is there will be an additional $12.1 million added to the Atlanta Police Department, as well as $4.9 million to the Fire Rescue Department, primarily to provide raises that have been promised from previous legislation. Um, most other departments that were mentioned on that chart that Kyle showed will be decreased by two to 5% of their fiscal year 2020 spending. There have been tons of conversations on the budget recently within Atlanta City Council, and there have been a few amendments that have been introduced. One of those being adding 427,000 to the Atlanta Citizen Review Board. And what they do is they serve as a mediator between police and citizens during police misconduct complaints. And the main things that they're trying to increase is funding for outreach, communication, additional positions and capacity, and relocation efforts. So if you're interested in something like an Atlanta Citizen Review Board, definitely look them up and see what they're about. Um, another addition that will be happening is 1.6 million will be added to launch the Equitable Growth Grant Program, and that will be focused on creation and attraction of middle wage jobs, so be on the lookout for that as well. Um, another addition that has been added during the City Council amendments is a $1.5 million expansion of the Atlanta Fulton County pre arrest Diversion Initiative. And what they are looking to do is support additional capacity to not just send people when they are arrested to jail, but to provide some pre arrest diversion initiatives such as including so uh, so social workers and other initiatives like housing food and things that people may need when they're in at-risk situations besides just sending them to jail, along with covering direct participant expenses and vehicles and additional office spaces as well. So those are the three main amendments along with the budget highlights that I listed earlier that you should be on the lookout for. And what I also want to mention again is the budget is not 100% stapled up once it is approved and there are amendments that happen all throughout the fiscal year. So we've talked a lot about the city of Atlanta and one of the things that we mentioned and one of the things that we saw in the survey was a lot of people are interested in providing more funding for education. So now I'm going to pass it back to Kyle where he'll talk a lot more about the Atlanta public school system and what the budget for education looks like in the city of Atlanta. Thanks, Asile. Um, so once again, just to familiarize yourself with the city of Atlanta or with the Atlanta public school system located in the city of Atlanta, it has roughly 52,000 students um, based upon last year's enrollment and that's anticipated to continue to grow. So any ideas on how much the budget uh, the, for, the, for the Atlanta public schools is? Guesses that it's higher or lower? Well, if you guessed higher, at least for the general fund, you are correct. Um, it's $843 million for this year, um, which works out to roughly $16,000 per student. Now, as is the case with the city of Atlanta, it has a, a fund structure, which includes funds beyond the general fund. So here's a breakout of the various funds that uh, Atlanta Public Schools has. Um, what's notable here is that uh, the special revenue fund is where a, a decent amount of money comes from, uh, mainly from the federal government um, with programs like Title I. Um, there's also a federal nutrition program to make sure the kids um, have access to, um, to food during the day if they uh, can't afford it on their own. Um, and here in the state of Georgia, we also have funds coming from the lottery to help pay for education. Um, and then the significant fund, as I mentioned before, with the earlier slide about the East Bloss, the Educational Special Purple, special Purpose Local Option Sales Tax, um, is that extra cent which helps to go pay for school construction, school renovation. So unlike the other funds in the city of Atlanta, uh, the general fund for Atlanta Public Schools 
easily surpasses the other funds. Um, that's where most of their money is coming from or from local sources. And we'll show that uh, a little further in this next slide where you can see that the vast majority, almost 80% um, of the revenue from the general fund um, comes from local taxes, mainly property taxes. Um, this is different from last year. There has been a sizable, or there's planned to be a sizable decrease in state funding that's coming to the school system. Um, so that'll be something we talk about uh, in just a minute. But you'll notice here as well that the uh, Atlanta Public Schools is tapping into its existing fund balance to help balance its budget for 2021. Now, where's the money going? Uh, most of the money for Atlanta Public Schools is going to pay for instruction. So that's paying for, for teachers to be in classrooms or uh, in a COVID world, be digitally accessible to their students. Uh, but uh, the number two sort of largest chunk of the budget is the maintenance and operations. So that is uh, covering the facilities, um, the other sort of capital costs that, uh, the, uh, full, that the Atlanta Public School System has. Um, and then pupil services are things like counseling and other things that are not instructional related, um, but direct, directly providing access and services to students. Um, and then you've got a, a various amount of uh, administration, both at the school level and in the central office for the school system. I'll pass it back to Asal to talk about some of the budget highlights uh, for 2021 for APS. Yes, highlights indeed. So um, some of the things that we're going to be looking for in the fiscal year coming up is a decrease of $5.8 million by delaying the purchase of new textbooks. Another thing that we'll be seeing is that schools will be giving up about $5.6 million in rainy day funds. And that is different from the funds that are balancing the accounts in that there's extra money on the side at the end of the year versus a savings account that was already allocated. Um, another thing that we'll be seeing is a decrease in per pupil allocation to schools by 1.8%. Earlier in the presentation, Kyle mentioned that there is a cost per pupil for this fiscal year of about 16,000. That is already allocated with that 1.8% decrease. So that shows the decrease that is already being represented. And that levels out to about 5 million across the total school system. And finally, we'll be seeing 8.7 million in central office reductions. Um, so that's what we're going to be seeing in the fiscal year of 2021 for APS, um, which starts on July 1st, as I mentioned, which is right around the corner. And we've talked a lot about Atlanta because forever we love Atlanta. We're going to be talking a little bit about the other counties and the other representation within the county as well as the state before we pass it off to our panelists. But first, I will give it back to Kyle. All right. Thanks, Lasalle. One other thing to touch on with this APS budget is unlike the city of Atlanta's budget, which was roughly the same amount as last year, um, Atlanta Public Schools is anticipating about a $20 million decline overall in revenue, mainly from uh, less revenue coming from the state and from local sales taxes. So um, many of you answered that you live uh, in the city of Atlanta, but also some of you live outside the city of Atlanta, but still in Fulton County or DeKalb County. Um, so once again, just some basic statistics to understand um, sort of what the total population in each of those uh, jurisdictions is. And we'll quickly share with you just what those budgets are. Um, these budgets are FY 2020, um, as shown on an earlier slide by Asile. Um, these budgets were actually approved back in January, um, rather than coming up for the, Jan for the July um, fiscal cycle like the city of Atlanta has. Um, so just be careful with these. These aren't exactly apples to apples. Um, each of these counties has a different fund structure, so they're funding different things out of this pot of money. Um, so it's not saying that DeKalb County residents uh, pay less in taxes or get less service. Um, there are things that are included in each of their budgets um, that don't necessarily directly correspond between the two. Um, and also, people besides residents are paying taxes and receiving services. Um, but this, we just wanted to give you some sort of sense of scale uh, as to where these uh, entities are getting their money and how they're spending their money. Likewise, at the state of Georgia, um, we're not going to get into this too much with the slides because this is an ever-changing thing. Um, our representatives are at the state capitol as we speak right now working on the budget. Um, so we'll see exactly where it lands. Uh, but for the roughly 10 million, 10 and a half million residents of the state of Georgia, we're getting into some big big dollar figures here, um, about 21, 22 million, billion dollars, uh, just depending upon where they sort of land today uh, with that budget, but about 2,600 or so dollars per resident across the state of Georgia. Um, once again, this is uh, still being worked on actively as we speak. Um, after this presentation, if you wanna run down to the state capitol and make some uh, last minute 
uh, lobbying efforts to, to get something uh, passed the way you want it to, feel free to do so as long as you keep your social distance and you wear a mask and you all do those things as well. But uh, this is still very, very much in process because uh, our state legislators were out for quite a while and came back into session just a couple weeks ago to wrap up this budget as well as pass some other legislation. So I'm gonna pass it back to Asyl to tell us uh, how you can get involved in your budget. Yes, please get involved in the budget. As we know, this is a conversation that is happening across the country, but particularly in the city of Atlanta, given that we are currently in budget season right now. And there are some really cool ways that you can get involved in the budget process, because as I continually mention, it is not something that is buttoned up at the end or beginning of a fiscal year. So here's some ways that you can get involved in that budget process. The first thing that you can do is go read the budget. Um, this is a very nuts and bolts understanding of the budget and how it works provided by us at CCI, but there's a lot more that what we've run through today. And you can see how much is being spent on salaries, how much is being spent on equipment, how much is being spent on technology, how much is being spent on past debt and future obligations. And it's a hefty document, but there are some little details in there that may be of particular interest to you if that's something that you're interested in. So definitely spend some time with the budget and familiarize yourself with it. And hopefully the tools and definitions that we provided today can help you navigate it and see how it works. Another thing that you can do, which I think is really important, is talking to your lo local officials and talking to your local advocates. Public comment is very popular right now, and rightly so. And that's one of the huge opportunities that you have to actually let your voice be heard and people are listening to you. Um, in addition to the local officials that are making those decisions on the budget, talking to local advocates about issue areas that you're interested in, whether that's public transportation, or housing, there are organizing efforts around those specific issues right now. So if you're interested in housing and want to get involved in how budget the budget affects housing, there are housing advocates all over the city and all over the state that you can unionize and organize with to be able to pre prevent a common agenda and present it for it and have that be one unified effort, which is really, really important, particularly given the times that we're seeing right now. Um, and that all goes to say, definitely speak up. Find out when budget meetings are happening. They're happening all the time. Provide public comment. There have been hours and hours and hours of public comment that have been presented, and people are getting their voices heard. There have been public comments that have been displayed until 5 in the morning because of how many people are showing up to have their voices be heard, which is really powerful and shows the power that people and residents within the city and the state truly have to have their voices be heard. Um, budgets are routinely amended throughout the year. So when finance committee is happening or when similar groups are happening, you can be an advocate for the issues that are important to you 365 days out of the year beyond just the budget times that we're seeing right now. So these are three main ways. And I think that these are all ways that you can unionize and organize year round about the budget. So that way when it becomes crunch time and the numbers are getting on the paper, you already have a voice at the table and know what it is that you want to get advocated for and you're organized with people that have similar interests as you. Um, so that's how you can get involved. And this has been an awesome nuts and bolts presentation on the budget. Um, we are now going to pass it off to our lovely panelists that we have here today. We're so excited to be joined by them. Kyle will be moderating that panel discussion and we're gonna dig into some specifics and answer some questions that you guys have about the budget. So thank you guys so much for joining us for that nuts and bolts portion. And I will pass it off to Kyle and our lovely panelists. All right, thanks, Asyl. And are we in gallery view? Can everybody see us? <clears throat> Panels, if you can go ahead and unmute yourselves. Uh, we'll start off just with some introductions. So the two special guests that we have with us today um, are Jennifer Ide from the Atlanta City Council um, and Alex Camardell from the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. So um, I'll be somewhat chivalrous here and start with Jennifer. Um, if you can just tell a little bit more, not about the whole city of Atlanta, but about uh, where the sort of finance committee falls into this overall sort of budget process um, and uh, how you're involved with the committee. Sure. So happy to be here with you all today. And I apologize. I was having some technical issues at the beginning of the meeting. So um, sorry, you couldn't see my face the whole time. But the city count, Atlanta City Council, I represent District 6, which is the area sort of around, um, centered around Piedmont Park, and came into council two years ago, two and a half years ago. Council has seven standing committees and finance executive committee is one of them. Um, we, throughout the course of the year, 
generally what's coming through us is anytime the city spends more than $20,000, it has to come through finance executive committee to be legislatively approved. And so that's everything from, you know, a contract to, you know, have a new rental car company at the airport to the city planning department needing to buy new copy machines. Um, that's our sort of bread and butter throughout the year. And then when it gets to budget season, we are obviously the committee that runs the budget process, which starts early in the year in March. We put together what the council's priorities are for the budget season. And, um, and then our, the way the budget process sort of works, the yin and the yang between the legislative branch, city council, and the executive branch of the mayor is we give the mayor our priorities and then the first Monday in May, she puts forward a proposed budget that the, um, she's worked with, with her departmental people and her finance team to put together the proposed budget for across the city. But today we're focusing mainly on the general fund. And that comes back to Atlanta City Council, to the finance committee, the finance chair running the process. And then we go for several weeks of having hearings on the proposed budget until we finally get to a meeting where we're going to debate, amend, and approve the budget. And so that's what we did um, a week ago today. We started our, we had a specially called meeting this year. We took it a little bit longer than we normally do. Um, we had a meeting that started Friday. We recessed at about 6 a.m. Saturday, started back up at one o'clock on Saturday, debated the budget, um, made several amendments, passed it, and my understanding is it's still awaiting the mayor's signature. So that will be our fiscal year 21 budget that runs from July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Um, and then as you all said, it is, it is a living, breathing document. I mean, that's what we start with, but there is a possibility for changes throughout the year. So that's essentially what our, um, you know, what the role the finance committee plays in the city's budget process. Great, thanks Jennifer. That was a great overview of the city's process and how things have shifted this year. So Alex, can you tell us a little bit more about the Ge Georgia Budget and Policy Institute and what your role is there? Yeah, so my name is Alex Carmadale. Uh, thank you CCI for bringing us together. Um, budget is in GBPI's name, so this is obviously a very fitting discussion for us. Uh, GBPI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization. Um, we're headquartered here in Atlanta, and uh, right down the street from the Capitol, and we're focused, um, hyper focused on state policies that improve economic opportunity for all Georgia. Um, budget and fiscal policy, tax policy, that is you know, one area of expertise, but we also cover issues related to healthcare, K 12 education, uh, uh, social services, and criminal justice as well. Um, but today we're, we're talking about budget and it's on all of our minds right now because we've been tracking our state budget um, pretty much year round. Um, the process is pretty similar to the local budget that was described for the city of Atlanta in terms of the process. Um, it's obviously a much larger pot of money, um, but it goes through um, a much shorter truncated and really I think complex and messy uh, process once it gets into the hands of the legislature, which is obviously a much larger elected body of officials. And the only thing that they are constitutionally obligated to do whenever they go to work for 40 days and 40 nights in the legislative session is pass a balanced budget. All of the other bills that they put forth and, and propose and lobbyists show up to, to support or oppose, um, those are all great. Those are all kind of filler, <laughs> but the main thing that they have to get done before July 1 is actually pass a balanced budget. And today is the final day of the Georgia legislative session. The House has possession of the final version of the bill and will be voting on it literally any moment now. My phone would be blowing up if it was on the floor now, but it's not. Um, so if folks want to see what the final version of the budget will be, uh, today that'll that'll head to the governor's desk and definitely tune in and watch virtually which you can do at legis.ga.gov um, but uh, just for a few minutes if it's okay I just want to share 
our little graphic that we use to visualize the actual budget process um, for the state of Georgia. Let's see. Thumbs up from the panelists if y'all can see it. Yep. Great. So like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's year long. Um, the budget that we're looking for for FY 2021 uh, that starts on July 1 is actually whenever we start the budget process for FY 2022 and for the amended fiscal year FY 2021. Like the local budgets, there's also an interim budget. In mid-year, they go back, they make changes based off of um, mostly revenue collections and or changes to that uh, stream of funds and um, vote once the session begins to make adjustments um, in the mid-year. But uh, we start out first with getting a governor's uh, revenue estimate for the upcoming fiscal year. How much money are we going to bring in based off of tax collections? Um, the biggest share of our tax collections for the state that take care of our, our people um, come from income tax collections. Um, the second to that are corporate taxes, and then we have our sales taxes. So um, the governor's office puts together a picture of how much money we can spend based off of those collections and puts forth a revenue estimate and then tells agencies that you have to work within these guardrails, within these guidelines to develop your budget for the next fiscal year. Um, so that's in that first bucket there. So agencies meet and they, they rapidly come together and meet with their boards um, at the state level, the Department of Education, Department of Corrections, all of the like, and put together their versions of a budget request. Um, and then the budget request is submitted and they, the governor's office uses those agency requests based off of the initial guidelines to develop his recommendation, his being our current governor, uh, Kemp, for the upcoming fiscal year. And once the governor releases the, his recommendation for the budget for the upcoming fiscal year, it lands in the legislature. And that's when all the fun stuff really starts. Because at that point, Again, it's at a much larger body, over 150 members in the House, over 50 plus members in the Senate, many committee meetings, many long nights, many debates uh, about different priorities that help determine what in the governor's recommendation stays and what goes. Um, it could, you, a budget can see a pretty radical transformation in that time period. Um, but again, they have to get that done in 40 days, non-consecutive, um, or less. And we are in a very unique situation right now because of the pandemic. Um, the session started in January, but was suspended indefinitely in March. Um, we had just got to the midpoint of the legislative session. And like Kyle mentioned, they only came back two weeks ago and within two weeks after a completely different economic picture was painted as a result of coronavirus, a significant impact to our uh, state income tax revenue and our corporate revenues. Um, they have been forced to kind of work with much lower um, in terms of funding to, to support all Georgians in the next fiscal year. And have made incredibly difficult challenging decisions in a very short period of time. So um, like Kyle and like others, I'm anxiously waiting to see what the final budget will be. Um, that the governor signs. Uh, once it leaves the General Assembly today, it'll go to his desk and he does have veto power. Um, so things can even change after the General Assembly makes decisions. Um, but for the most part, it, we, are, we are at the end of this thing and will not have another chance to um, change this current budget in the mid-year until around January. But the process is truly year long. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Alex. And that is a sort of key distinction between the state and the city, where at the state, the legislators are only in session for a limited time of the year, whereas our city council members like Jennifer Hyde are there throughout the year um, and are able to make changes along the way rather than have to be called back into a special session. Um, so each of you touched on it a little bit, but I am interested in learning a little bit more um, how the global pandemic, the coronavirus or COVID-19 affected both the process as well as some of the, uh, the numbers that we're seeing for the budget this year. Um, Jennifer, can you tell us a little bit about how that has affected um, sort of the, the city's overall uh, sort of revenue and expense picture for 2021? Still muted, Jennifer. 
Okay, you got me now? Yep. We can okay. Um, right. So even though it sometimes appears that our budget process starts the first week of May, it starts way back in the winter and early spring with, um, you know, our finance team putting a budget together. And so they've been, you know, happily working along thinking we were in a strong economy. We, you know, had a um, healthy reserve, you know, totally on one course. And then when the pandemic hit and the, you know, the mayor decided we really, at least even before the state did, decided we needed to shut down in the city, um, we quickly had to put everything on pause. We actually hired some consultants to go look at what the likely impact was going to be. Um, I know you had put the slide up there on what our revenue sources are in, in Atlanta, and we're lucky that it's, um, we have a pretty diverse um, revenue base, and the economic shutdown really has not had a near-term impact on property tax, so we had some stability there. But as far as both our sales tax, our hotel motel, our alcohol license, even as far as our like fines and forfeitures, our traffic tickets, I mean, that just wasn't happening. Um, business taxes were due in this um, window, and so we had to do a real analysis of what the likely impact was going to be, and we did it on a five-year out um, program. We ran a couple of different scenarios, and so where we decided to start with was last year, our general fund revenues had been 677. Um, we did this analysis and decided we were likely to have somewhere around a $55 million hit to revenues, um, which if you had seen the original proposed budget, it proposed drawing $37 million from our reserve, and then it also had proposed pulling $17 million from the east side TAD, and that was going to be the other sort of revenue plug that we um, had done. On the, we didn't just start with, well, how can we plug revenue? We also, the finance team and the administration went to each department to see where could we really cut cost, and they did it with an eye that they didn't want to, I mean, about two thirds of our budget is people. And we didn't want to, in this difficult time for everybody, be laying people off. So how could we cut costs without um, laying people off? And they went through, and this isn't very appear apparent until you start digging into the budget. We went through and found $43 million in efficiencies and savings we had to lay on top of that this budget anticipated a $40 million increase in expenses that were primarily driven by the public safety raises that had been um, a multi-year um, legislative process to bring our um, firefighters and our police officers up to a market rate. We also had some increase in healthcare costs for employees that we had, the city had decided that we would absorb most of the cost of that instead of passing it to employees and we had some pension increases so we cut by 43 million we added 40 million back on and then we looked to fill the gap with the um, pulling from the reserve and pulling from the east side tad as the budget process went on and we we had some we had more time to deal with this we and this is one reason why i called a specially called meeting and pushed a little later we were able to watch as we got the march and April um, sales tax numbers in from the state. And we did a little bit, our projections had been a little bit more dire than what played out. And so um, we decided that we weren't going to pull the money from the East Side TAD to accommodate that. So it was very, very fluid. Um, there were a lot of decisions that sort of had to be made from the top without um, necessarily the consultation with the departments that the finance and budget team would normally do because they had to, you know, take one budget, scratch it, and come up with something that was a lot different. Yeah, no, thanks for that explanation as to how things sort of evolved this year differently um, and the constantly sort of reevaluating, getting assessments and, and uh, working off of actual numbers that were starting to come in rather than some of those earlier projections, so. Yeah, and we'll do that throughout the year. Um, I put in some legislation requiring the CFO to come to finance exec every month. I mean, which he's there anyway, but to make specifically make a report of how the actuals on revenue are comparing to the projections that we based our budget on so that we can track it month to month of, you know, did we, you know, did we pick the right number? Yep. So Alex, you spoke a little bit too about how COVID has affected this process. Can you tell us a little bit more, um, sort of how that's affected uh, sort of processes from 
from what I can recall here, and there were already plans uh, from the governor to, to have sort of across the board cuts, um, but obviously with declining revenue anticipating to come in, there were probably some additional um, further, deeper, harder cuts to make for this year's budget. Yeah. So um, it, was, it was close to doomsday whenever we got the initial uh, cut estimate um, right after the pandemic um, suspension of, se of session. Uh, all agencies from the governor's office, uh, the order came to cut all agency budgets by 14%. And I think that's reflected in the 21 billion number that was lifted up earlier. Um, the agencies had to work very fast to uh, reassess their budgets and find you know, what they refer to as savings, what we continue to refer to as just cuts to programs in their budgets um, so that they could meet that 14% threshold. Um, for context purposes, and this you know, complicates things even further, in the previous fiscal year, at the amended fiscal year, they were required to make cuts because of a significant slowdown in revenue before the coronavirus was even taking hold of Georgia. So um, they've been in a pretty precarious situation. The, uh, since then though, since the legislat uh, legislature has reconvened, and since a couple more months have passed, and because we've seen kind of more of an uptick in sales taxes and corporate income taxes uh, just over the last uh, month or so, they have revised the revenue estimate uh, down from 11 to 10 percent. So the depth of the cuts are much less now on the final day of legislative session than they were as proposed maybe two, two months ago. Um, so the total budget in 2020 was about $28, million, $28 billion, excuse me. And for the upcoming fiscal year, as the current version of the budget stands, it'll be roughly $25 billion or so. Um, for the for the next fiscal year, uh, a lot of you know the process is messy. Like I said, there are a lot of political priorities that are included in the budget, um, based off of the the needs of the constituents that are uh, represented within the legislature, um, and and those are you know what cause a lot of programs and services to might maybe get cut more than others, or made whole or not or restored. Um, so that's something to keep in mind whenever you're watching these debates about the budget and you can hear members of the legislative body actually say, well, my members really wanted this senior care facility in the community. So that's why you see that made whole while something else is, is not um, necessarily made whole or restored. Um, another important thing to note in this particular budget is that Georgia did receive a substantial amount of care funding authorized by Congress. So Georgia's gonna get a share of that, and then a lot of that money is gonna be distributed to local governments and school boards. My understanding is that many um, local municipalities have already received CARES funding. I know I'm seeing reports of school districts that have also gotten their allocations and are starting to uh, make plans or deploy those resources in their communities. Um, but those funds are also used to supplant um, some of the cuts in our current budget. Um, that were impacted by the coronavirus. So that'll help uh, stave off the depth of some of these cuts that we were seeing before, but certainly um, doesn't bring us to where we need to be for a, um, to, to survive, I think, uh, a prolonged, potentially prolonged recession uh, over the next um, couple of years, maybe. We'll see. Yeah. No, thanks for that, Alex. And uh, you mentioned the CARES Act, and Jennifer, I'm curious, because um, there has been discussion at the city level about some of that funding as well. Um, can you explain a little bit more about, um, even though it might not fit in the 2021 budget, but how the city is planning to, to use the federal dollars it's received in response to the COVID crisis? Yeah, so we got two different um, sort of buckets of federal dollars. We are getting some FEMA dollars that we can use to reimburse really our direct pandemic um, expenses, I mean, PPE and that sort of um, thing, the, pr the protective gear. So having to outfit our public safety, our solid waste, our, um, you know, our frontline workers with <clears throat> um, protective gear, um, I, I think we'll probably go towards the FEMA money for that. We were allocated $88 million of um, the CARES Act money um, that it's, 
so yes and no, it can be used. It, it really is supposed to be used for expenses that weren't in the most recent budget. So we can't use it for just straight out, oh, we have a revenue gap, we'll plug the hole and we'll put it in there and we can use it um, for anything. It, um, it's gone into several different programs. Some of it will be for, um, I believe we can use it for hazard pay. I believe we can use it for some um, programs that Invest Atlanta is doing on rental assistance. Um, they need to be programs related to the pandemic response, but we, you know, we have a little bit more flexibility with the CARES Act on, um, on more flexibility there than on the, the FEMA. So we are trying to do it on programming that supports the community. It's not just the direct, oh, we need to buy, you know, gowns and gloves and masks and cleaning supplies. Gotcha. No, thanks for that explanation. And as we know, with many of these federal programs, the, the, sometimes the requirements or the uh, availability of funding sort of shifts. Um, so it, and that's what's happened here. Yeah. 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 Um, so to shift the conversation a little bit, um, take it back to you, Alex, um, that obviously sort of given the other sort of social conditions we're working with right now, not just this sort of health crisis, but um, calls for you know, social justice, uh, fixing racial inequality. Um, it's my understanding of your role at the GBPI, that what, what you focus on is uh, inequalities um, and economic mobility. Can you explain a little bit more or uh, help us understand um, through some of that presentation we gave before about where money is coming from and where it's going to and how that could either uh, help or hurt uh, our, our, our efforts to try to be more progressive and to address some of these systemic challenges? Yes, absolutely. So um, we prioritize racial equity in most of our politics, um, and, and it's becoming an even bigger priority in our budget advocacy as well. Um, you know, I think we start from the position of a budget being a statement of priorities. Um, we've all heard a budget is supposed to be a moral document. Um, so if it worsens inequities or inequality, then, you know, maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and correct um, where necessary. Um, but this is um, something that uh, is amplified, I think, during the current fiscal crisis that we're facing at the state level, because we've made decisions to cut certain programs that are vital to uh, fighting off or saving off a potential uh, deep recession at the state level, while maintaining certain uh, supports and, and business breaks and, and you know, refusing to raise revenue where necessary that could really help fill the gaps, you know. You know, just as an example, for the upcoming fiscal year, the current budget plans to cut our K-12 education by nearly a billion dollars while essentially maintaining or keeping whole um, the entire $9.8 billion in tax credits that we dole out without review across the state of Georgia. Um, so there's a disproportionate impact there um, and these are policy choices that are made within those 40 days, you know, um, that can have very serious consequences. I mean, all of the evidence is, is clear. Whenever you cut during a recession or during a downturn, then you will worsen racial and economic inequities, period. Um, but when you invest and you support the safety net through work supports like food assistance and direct cash and other things, then those actually have a positive impact on communities of color who are more likely to be overrepresented in those who are eligible for, for assistance during these times. Um, so that's been our main message. You know, we don't need to just cut. Cutting is not the only path to uh, surviving this economic crisis. We should also raise revenue. Um, you know, we know that we're far from raising the income tax in the state of Georgia, um, but there are other sensible ways that we've been fighting for, such as raising the tobacco tax, which would increase about $600 million in revenue. And some argue it is regressive in nature. And quite frankly, it is regressive in nature, but the outsized benefits um, are for communities of color and in terms of those who have, you know, health complications and benefits. Similarly, for the film tax credit, you know, an audit was released at the end of 2019, finding that there is not necessarily the biggest bang for our buck whenever it comes to the amount of money we give out in the film credit, why not review and evaluate and think about trimming back some of those dollars so that we can reinvest that money into communities or you know, maybe to our schools, um, or for example. Um, so there are other ways that, that we think that are part of the solution, 
Um, the challenge that we only find um, ways to balance the budget by cutting, and that is not the only answer here. So um, that's my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for getting in that soapbox. And uh, one other question, because you mentioned uh, schools, and obviously that's been a major sort of point of contention regarding how deep cuts might affect schools. Um, can you explain a little bit, because um, as I showed in that earlier chart, most of the school budget is coming from local sources, but there is a portion coming from the state. And from what I've read in the news, there's been some debate whether or not uh, there should be across the board, every school system takes the same cut, or is equity a part of that conversation to try to balance those things back out? Okay, so I'm not gonna lie, I have a colleague who's our education analyst, <laughs> Stephen Owens, Dr. Stephen Owens, he, he's, you can find him at gbpi.org, and he's really the expert on the funding formula. Um, I can say that the funding formula that is represented by the state share in local school funding is the Quality Basic Education Act, um, QBE, um, ironically, while it is a small portion of the um, local school budgets, education is the largest portion of the state budget, of state funding. Um, so, um, so I won't even try to finesse and act like <laughs> I know exactly um, how uh, the, the, the local share of education money is distributed through different school districts. Um, I know that we have been fighting um, as a as collectively for the last year for some form of better equalization and equity in the education form um, through uh, stabilization grants and other forms of, of equity uh, funding uh, for, for schools. Um, essentially making sure that those low wealth districts in the state of Georgia um, that serve predominantly um, students of color that are in low income community have an equitable share of funding um, given all of the inequities that are deeply entrenched in like property taxes right which is a big source of funding for for um, school so, and I'm, I'm happy to make the connection to Stephen. Um, yes. we'll uh, save that for another budget talk budget uh, 102 or 201 whatever it happens to be but uh yeah, thanks yeah. for that and um i will go ahead and give you a plug um that uh, gvpi is active on social media has a uh, doing blog posts, keeping folks informed. So not that we want you to leave this presentation now, but definitely after it's done, go check out all their resources. Um, so to flip it over to Jennifer, um, from that initial poll that we had for folks who are participating, um, there's obviously a lot of interest in uh, funding a lot of things besides the police and potentially taking money away from the police. Um, and as Asile mentioned earlier, lots of people have been calling in, um, reaching out to city council members, trying to uh, persuade various members to to change the police funding um, we don't have to get into all of it here but can you explain a little bit more about how, sort of how that process uh, played out in just the past few weeks uh, with the city of atlanta's budget yeah and it really was um, i mean this was a very very fluid budget year and sort of the public safety issue that had been front of mind for the city council and the mayor and um, from the advocates that we were hearing from at the beginning of the budget process related to our city jail, because we've been in a discussion, um, a dialogue, had a great task force working um, on reimagining, and part of the reimagining was the closing of our city jail. And that's been really, it's been a long, many, many year discussion in Atlanta of whether we need a municipal jail or not, but under Mayor Bottoms and some of the criminal justice reform that um, she's done with the Atlanta City Council of um, trying to get rid of um, cash bail, which we mostly have. We just haven't had the, between abolishing cash bail and not contracting with ICE anymore, our headcount in our jail has gone way down and we haven't had the need for it. And you can, people are different philosophically on whether we should have one to begin with anyway. But that had been in the works. We had not received the final recommendation from the task force because COVID shut the meetings down on what we were doing. So going into the budget, we all knew that that was one of those head scratchers of, well, we've allocated $18 million for a jail that we plan to close. And why are we doing that? So that's where the discussion had been. And when um, those budget hearings and part of the budget process for the city is we do do an interactive community um, evening budget meeting that normally is in person and people can call in, write in. Um, it was great this year. Our my our staff really went above and beyond, and we you know took comments via Twitter, mm -hmm. 
Facebook, all throughout that. And that was the bulk of the public comment related. And so we, the mayor worked on that. We worked on, on that to come up with a plan for what could we do during the transition period that did put that money more into public facing um, um, positions. And then, you know, across the country, the attention turned to police and turned to police in Atlanta in a general way and then turned to police in Atlanta in a very specific way with the killing of Mr. Brooks. And really that just um, lit a fire that we haven't heard that much discussion about the role of policing in Atlanta from the broader public. I mean, from, from advocates, I'm certain we have, but from the broader public, we've never had this sort of desire to have a very public conversation and to take very concrete actions on it. Um, the, we were really down to the wire when that started to, Mr. Brooks was killed on a Friday night before what would have been the meeting where we passed the budget, June 15th. I had already pushed that out to the end of the week, to the 19th, but there was a week between when that all began and when we were scheduled to pass a budget. Um, and I'll tell you the hard part of that discussion, no matter where you are on how much policing we need in Atlanta, what form and shape that could take, is it's people's jobs. I mean, two thirds of our budget is jobs and to make a decision within a week that lets people go who have um, you know, mortgages, school loans, you know, children to feed and all of that. It, I, I certainly heard from the public and, you know, the, the feedback was across the spectrum of how people felt about it. Um, we heard from many, many people that just think we need to have a smaller police force. That's not a decision we could make in a week. Um, there was, a, there is a resolution that passed that I put forward that would have essentially put somewhere between a third to a half of their money in the escrow um, account with an APD to make a public statement that we are going to work on this as we you know, go throughout the year. The resolution passed, but then when it came time to move the money, the budget amendment didn't pass. And so I, I have confidence in my colleagues that voted no for the budget amendment, that they are committed to the process of having the discussion of what does public safety look like in Atlanta and making the necessary budgetary changes, if there are um, any, which I would think there would be, um, as we do that across the year. But I, I had sympathy for the, you know, I heard the public that they wanted something immediate in this year's budget. Um, but the reality of it is, you know, we can't make a decision like that on where it infects, where it impacts whether people have a job or not in a week's time. Gotcha. Um, we did briefly cover some of the amendments that were made at that last council session. Is there anything in particular you would want to sort of highlight or talk about? And I know that um, <clears throat> from watching the budget sort of the final meeting, um, there was a lot of debate, a lot of yeah. real sort of discussion about um, all these things and whether or not um, the budget was the right place to have this conversation. Um, and we can take this to Alex in a second, but Jennifer, I'd love to get your sort of thought um, on, you know, where budget and policy sort of mesh and maybe where there's some disconnect between those two um, or how, um, when it's best to use one tool um, and when it might be better to, to be looking at the budget as uh, that sort of means of enacting a, a, a policy change. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think Alex said this earlier, I think a um, entity, in our case, a city's budget, um, does reflect their priorities. It reflects their worldview of, you know, what the role of the city is. And so um, I think the budget is definitely the appropriate time to talk about um, policy issues. And it really is one of the, it's, it's the primary time during the year where the legislative branch has more of a hands-on say in the running of the city. Um, I mean, down to a little bit more granular than we normally do. So I definitely think it's time. I am somebody who, I'm an attorney litigator by background, not conflict adverse. I think, you know, conflict and those debates and discussions are a good thing. Mm -hmm. If, you know, it's too easy and we're not pushing ourselves if there's not debate and disagreement, because I think that's where you're, you know, <laughs> your deeper thinking happens when you're not all agreeing. 
Yeah. So, you know, it was a, it was an exhausting meeting, but I think it was a really good meeting and the pushing on the, on the APD budget, while we didn't make a budgetary change there out of that, I think came a stronger desire to do something. And so we got some really good um, amendments done of expanding the pre-arrest diversion program, which has been a very successful program in providing assistance to individuals who are at risk of arrest and providing them, whether it's homeless services, housing, healthcare, job training. And we've been doing that in two of the police zones in the city for a while, working with the county and it's very successful. And so we found the money to expand that across the um, city. We have put additional money into the citizen review board um, and I think we may even do some more of that over the coming year. Um, my colleague, Matt Westmoreland, um, found some money for um, mid-level job support in the system that'll be operated through Invest Atlanta. So I, I think of putting some real pressure on, and listening to the public, you know, that it was two pieces. It was, you know, people saying we don't want as much money going to police, but it was also people saying, and this is what we'd like to get the money to go towards. So finding some other money to go towards those kind of programs um, was important. I do think this budget year will be even more fluid than most. I mean, we will hear from the chief operating officer of the city um, in the early fall of what his recommendations are for policing in Atlanta, public safety in Atlanta. And I think there'll have be some discussion there, but I think as the, as the year goes on, we will probably be more engaged in that process than there will probably be more activity, I think, with the budget. Um, and also, we're going to have to watch it on the revenue side. So there may be some changes we have to make, not because we think of great new programs that we want to do, but because the revenues are making us anxious. Yeah, no, that's understandable. And we're all fearful of a, a second wave or some other things could seriously damage the, the prospects for uh, revenue coming in. So Alex, I want to get you back on a soapbox um, as GBPI budget and policy. Talk to me a little bit about uh, sort of how those two are, are, are tied together. Yeah, I mean, we, let me not speak for everybody, you know, on our team, but I mean, I have a really hard time, um, you know, taking the two apart or teasing out budget and policy because policy is a reflection of, of choices and the way that we budget things are also choices and they're driven by a process, um, you know, so a, a policy making process, you know, our budget at the state level is literally a bill. It's HB right now, HB 793, and it has to go through the full procedural process that um, all other legislation has to go through. Even in that debate, the reason why, and I appreciate Jennifer for bringing this up, um, you know, the, the, during that debate, like it's a great opportunity to insert issues that are not reflected with dollars in the budget. Um, you know, so one example is um, we say a lot that we're you know the number one state for business um, here in Georgia, but there isn't nearly enough investment in things like you know workforce development to make sure that they have the workforce necessary to really you know grow their businesses here and people can tap into those opportunities and become economically mobile um one really good policy conversation that happens in tandem with the budget is um and this may be this sounds political and it's not but it's medicaid expansion um you know georgia is one of few states that does not have medicaid uh expansion over 500,000 people are uninsured as a result of that, and even more are uninsured now since over 2 million people have filed for unemployment insurance in the state of Georgia just in the last couple of months. So we are already faced with high rates of uninsured. So all of these things are, are talking points that are uh, being made whenever we're having a budget debate at the Capitol. Um, the lawmakers are making these points because we're not investing significantly in healthcare and our hospitals are struggling and we're having to cut their funding through the state budget. But if we were to expand Medicaid, then we can draw down a nine to one match and bring down billions of dollars in federal aid to help people get insured and keep our, um, our hospitals um, operating and thriving and, and other things. And you know, that is uh, you know, a priority that is uh, represented by constituents, it's represented by the members, 
Um, people say that they want it overwhelmingly, but it's not reflected in the line items in the budget. And that is a place where you can actually enact Medicaid expansions in the budget because you have to put up the dollars in order to get the match. Um, so I think massive um, policy change can happen as a result of budget advocacy. Um, on, the, on the flip side, you can have policies passed um, obviously, and then have no funding to pay for the policy change. Um, one example is um, George is well known for its Hope Scholarship, which is uh, for college students and it's merit based, but we don't have a need based aid scholarship program here in the state of Georgia. So a couple of years ago, my colleagues got that bill passed and created the needs based aid program, but there has not been any mo money in the budget to finance it. So it kind of works both ways um, yeah. in, in that example. But yeah, though, they're, they're so inextricably linked. Um, it's, I struggle with teasing them <laughs> apart a little bit. Yeah, no, thanks. And um, speaking of links, um, this question can, can easily be for both of you. Just wondering, um, since we've heard these various calls for reform and money being shifted from one um, line of business, you know, people wanting to defund the police and instead spend money in education. Um, as hopefully you, know, you might have seen through the sort of first part of the presentation, um, that these various pots of money go to different places and each of these entities has a different role to play. Um, so Jennifer, can you start off and explain a little bit about how sort of the conversations happening um, at the city, uh, but also as, as you are a parent of uh, students and uh, you know, connection with schools, like how do we um, as, a, as a community start to grapple with, well maybe uh, we want to shift the, the money, but it needs to go, it needs to either come from a different source or it needs to go to a different entity because the city of Atlanta can't you know, by itself go improve the school system. Yeah, and I think that that is an issue that there's, um, is always a discussion even before, I think it got heightened during the COVID response and I think it's gotten heightened during the public safety police response. So Atlanta's a complicated city of having two counties, an independent school system, and and then MARTA being its own, you know, um, entity as well. And so there's a lot of times where we have to take a little bit of a pause and figure out, you know, people are asking us to, I mean, sometimes there's just a lack of understanding of the public of who does what. And so when people are saying cut money from the police budget and put it into schools, you know, it's not going to, you know, work that way that we take money that used to pay police officers and it's going to pay teachers. But there are things that, you know, we can do to support our students. I mean, whether it is focusing transportation projects around schools to make safe routes to schools for kids to get to schools, whether um, it's, you know, another in the transportation front that I've been working on for about a year is some of the red light speeding to make sure that we don't have um, Speeding, we've been, we have worked with APS during COVID on um, some of the food and meal delivery. So there is some of that. I will say in the, in the, um, so I think when we're working well with our sister agencies, which we don't always do a good job of, we are having some, we are having discussions about where can we collaborate of what piece do we do? What piece does APS do? What piece does the county do? What piece does MARTA do? Um, on public safety, I think that's really going to take some deeper collaboration and more so with the counties than with the school system because, um, you know, there, when you get to, you know, 911 responses to a homeless individual in a crisis, um, that may be something that's better suited for the county, both within its, um, you know, within its mission and within the resources that it has. Um, so I think some of it is trying to figure out who is best suited to it, and then we'll figure out the, you know, will they just take it on? Do we have need to have an intergovernmental agreement that has some money aspect to who works together um, on it? So I, I think that it is something that we can't solve on our own. APS can't solve on their own. The counties can't solve on their own, and we need to spend more time working together um, and I think that both through COVID and through this broader discussion about public safety it's going to push us to do some of that work we've been needing to do anyway. Yeah 
Um, Alex, same question to you, sort of how, how do you see that connection, maybe not between different sort of local governments between um, the state and the local governments, obviously some programs or some things uh, there is uh, where the state allows cities to do things and other things where the state can restrict um, a city's ability to, to participate in, in certain activities. Yeah, um, so the the, that is our, I think, I will, I will die on this, on this hill. Um, one of our biggest to economic opportunity in Georgia will be preemption um, at the state level. Um, for those who don't know, currently the state forbids local cities and counties, local governments from raising their minimum wage for anybody who doesn't work for that government. The state also forbids local governments from enacting fair scheduling or so that low-income workers who may work hourly jobs at least know when to come to work in, in the next week. The state government forbids local governments from enacting paid leave fees across the board for anybody who work for their government. So um, we have a, some of the most draconian uh, preemption laws in the country here in Georgia. Um, you know, I'm adamantly... Um, believe that we should raise our minimum wage at this, in the state of Georgia, um, but recognizing that we might not have that broad wage increase at the state level, that local governments can lead on that. And I know the city of Atlanta has for its employees, Clarkston and others, like they want to do this, but um, the preemption issue is, is, is going to stay uh, a big issue. So we're, we need to get that repealed and there are always proposals to repeal preemption. Um, we just don't have, we don't necessarily have the political will at this current moment, um, but, you know, elections matter, so that's all I can say, <laughs> say there, um, but that makes a big difference, right, because um, Georgia is known for being um, number one for business, um, but in Atlanta is number one for income inequality, so how can those two things be true? You know, number one for business, when we had the lowest unemployment rate in history, uh, with three point, roughly 3.4% statewide before the pandemic, and obviously that's exploded since then up to 12%. But before that, we touted that low unemployment rate, but the median wage was around $40,000, $45,000 a year, well below a living wage for a family of three. And far too many people were struggling across the state of Georgia. Um, our state minimum wage right now is $5.15, the lowest in the nation. Um, obviously, for most workers, you're subject to the 725, but if you, um, unless you're an agricultural worker or a youth worker, or what really kills me is that it is perfectly legal to uh, pay people with disabilities a sub-minimum wage. Um, but that is, you know, and people will say, well, we make the minimum, you know, we, we, you'll get the 725 in Georgia. I'm like, that's all fine and well, but I mean, is the 725 where we want to be even, something that hasn't changed in 10 years? Meanwhile, the cost of living has skyrocketed since then. Um, I don't think so. So uh, the state really needs to repeal its preemption law so that local governments, um, looking at a city of Atlanta or even in East Point, I live in South Fulton and East Point, you know, which is a majority black city, like we need higher wage jobs. We need employers who, you know, want to do the right thing and pay their workers more to be on board to raise our wages. And we need the state's help, but we need at least the city's help in getting us to that point. And the state ties our hands. Um, preemption across the country has a disproportionate impact on communities of color, um, localities that are um, mostly uh, people of color and have uh, large pockets of low income folks, um, because it is a, uh, it's a tactic that is driven in a way that prioritizes business over people. Um, similar to like our, our incentives, right? Like what are the, what's part of the incentive package for opening up a giant manufacturer in a rural Georgia County? Not just the tax breaks, right? But also, oh, I don't have to worry about me having to raise my wage or pay workers a living wage because in Georgia it's illegal for anybody to force me to do that or require that even. So that, um, you got me back in my soapbox. <laughs> but it, um, the relationship there, I think, um, between the state and the city is, is it's been perverse, it's been violent, it's been hot, right? Um, just, there were rumors just today that state lawmakers are looking to, you know, potentially take over the airport again. And this came up last year, right? There was a huge debate about it. 
Um, you know, what that signals to me is that there's this, con and this comes up in legislative debate, there's this misconception conception or assumption that um, cities or communities that, you know, are governed mostly by people of color that have a lot of people of color in their population uh, mismanage um, their money to operate government, so on and so forth. And while, you know, all governments have their challenges, um, it's not necessarily fair to make that, that presumption. And um, a lot of, there's a long history in the state of Georgia of that particular thought and those attitudes being driven by um, sometimes racism and, and other things. Um, and it, it materializes still to this day in the legislature. Uh, we see that same attitude uh, applied to our level of investment in the safety net or in quote unquote welfare, right? It's the reason why we spend, you know, far less per capita on residents in the state of Georgia at the state level than we did before the Great Recession because we have just chipped away at our social safety net since then because people need to learn to quote unquote work hard and pull themselves up the strap. Um, the economy doesn't function in a way that allows that to work evenly for everybody. So um, we need to, you know, we need to address that mentality. It's really holding holding us back. It, it results in policies like preemption. Um, so yeah, I'm back on that point. <laughs> <laughs> but just, I would say thank you for raising the preemption issue. It drives us crazy at the city. I mean, we, we had a discussion in the last year about adding to our um, procurement grading of being able to give, you know, basically extra credit for people that paid them $15 minimum wage and we're told you know absolutely can't do that under state law and so it's it's really frustrating when we want to do some of the measures at the city that will help with that economic mobility and we you know in the state has said no yeah yeah jennifer uh, correct me if i'm wrong but the city actually has lobbyists to work and are advocating at the state capitol as well as uh, passing resolutions trying to uh Use, use those to try to convince our state legislatures to, um, to allow the city to do things that currently it's restricted from doing? That is true. We do have a government affairs team. Um, very often we go into the session with things that we want to accomplish and we quickly end up on the defensive for things that it feels like the state is trying to do to the city. So, um, you know, we have to fight on both battles there and, and pick those, um, you know, um, things that we actually want to push pretty carefully. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as Alex said, this airport monster keeps popping its head up. So that's, that's always sort of the threat of, you know, don't ask for much because this is out there. Yeah, I mean, and as you saw with the uh, earlier sort of slide presentation, that the, the general fund budget for the city of Atlanta is roughly equivalent to the airport revenue budget as well. So it is a considerable amount of money, and uh, therefore it's important to the city, but also the state has interest in it as well. Um, so I do want to pull a couple questions, at least from the Q&A um, that have come up. So first, uh, just to get some clarification, I think um, when we were talking before, Jennifer, about uh, sort of money going from police to schools and some challenges to, to do that, at least sort of directly. Can you explain a little bit more about uh, the separation between APS and the city of Atlanta? Right, so we, in Atlanta, we do have an independent school system. So they have their own governing body. They have um, the school board um, governs and hires the superintendent who runs the school system and their own tax base, as you said, they get about 50% of the property taxes, we get about 25% and the county gets about 25%. So there's really very, there's, you know, those are separate and independent. There's not an overlap within our budgets. We don't do a joint budgeting process with them, but where there are um, issues that, you know, on that boundary of where, you know, their duty and responsibility to educate children comes up with some of our duty and responsibility to take care of our residents in other ways is where I think we look to, um, might be after school programming, it might be some transportation issues, it might be safety issues. Um, I will say the Atlanta Public Schools used to use the Atlanta Police Department for their resource officers and for some of their on-site policing. A few years ago, they moved into having their own 
um, internal um, safety officers. So we don't we don't provide that service to them anymore. Um, so it would be to actually take money away from Atlanta police towards education would be taking money from the city of Atlanta to the Atlanta public school systems that would, I'm imagining that's actually would be a state law issue of reallocating um, the split of that property tax. I haven't heard anybody really talking about pursuing that. I think it's more, I would, I would say more in terms of is there, can we have an increased um, focus in our city of Atlanta budget to support our um, students and and young people is probably the better way of looking at it than taking funds directly out of one entity's budget into another entity's budget. Can I can I say, you know, just to add to that, the we're a statewide organization, so we get pulled into this conversation explain to folks that 80 They say like, how do we redirect, um, divest, invest, you know, police spending in, in schools? And I have to remind folks that literally right now, our legislators are deciding to cut education a billion dollars right now <laughs> from education. And we don't even, you know, maybe Jennifer or others, you know, know how much that will fall on each district um, at this time. But, um, you know, this is a, a, there's layers to this. And, um, we we want folks to know you know i, I agree jennifer it probably will have be a change in statute because you were essentially changing the local share of funds that go to a particular school that impacts the qbe in many ways but the other way like there are other ways to get to increased funding for schools yeah you know without me without me taking a position on defund police i'm not even talking about it. i'm talking about we want to raise investments in education then we need to fight some of the way that we tax things. We need to raise revenue for students. We need to uh, and fight the, the one billion dollars in cuts that are being decided right now. Right, that we hope you know maybe the governor will veto if this budget passes. But um, I just wanted to add add to that because um, it's there's just so many layers to this, and this might be a good example of how the state and the yeah, local yeah. interact so intimately. Yeah, one of the other questions that keeps coming up in the uh, Q&A is uh, regarding the complexity. You were talking about the layers and all the sort of nuance of these things. Um, and one of the reasons we're hosting this event is to try to make it hopefully a little easier to understand or to gain some access points or sort of know some of the lingo um, and sort of who the entities are. But any recommendations from, from either of you or what your organizations are doing to try to make it at least somewhat more accessible? Um, and Jennifer, I know listening to the, to the meeting on Saturday, you were having difficulty getting straight answers from <laughs> the finance department on portions of the budget. Um, and obviously I would hope that the finance committee chair could, could get the answers that she was looking for. Um, but how do, how do we sort of solve that issue so that we're not having to, uh, to, to not make the right decisions because there aren't people who know and are advocating for the right thing because they're so, they're, they're telling you to move money from police to education and you have to spend your time explaining to them how that's a lot more challenging than it seems to be just to sort of articulate those words. Yeah, no, it occurred to me, um, and I think, you know, these discussions are a whole lot easier when there's enough money to go around or when there hasn't been a crisis that's sort of thrown it, you know, into people's, um, you know, forefront. But it did occur to me this year that, as much as we have what feels like a thorough budget process that we need to back it up and start in January to let the public know because you can't wait until it's too late to have an impact to make a change and so I really do think some just um, broader public education on our budget um, our budget and how to participate and how to participate at a point in time that we may be able to make some changes versus, you know, a week beforehand. So I'm going to work on that, um, you know, on this during the second half of the year with city council, um, with our um, policy and research staff of what materials we can put together that, you know, really just starts from sort of a primer on city um, finances and lets people know earlier on how they can get, how they can get involved. 
Gotcha. That, that would be incredibly helpful, um, at least to yeah. the 2,000 plus people who called in and wanted to make sure that you understood their, uh, their opinions on, on where the money should be shifting. So. Well, and I think honestly, you know, to back it up, uh, you know, when council puts in priorities early in the spring as the budget's being formed, we really need to do our first, you know, listening sessions and whatever other process that we want to do. And I think one of the upsides of us all being virtual is figuring out how to do public engagement virtually. And we found that we've gotten much higher numbers um, when we have, you know, done polling or allowing a voicemail than if somebody has to, you know, take off, you know, their time during their lunch hour and go tromp to city hall and sit in the conference room. So um, I do think of, of really front ending that from the council side so that we're hearing from our um, constituents, because I mean, the mayor has her policies, but she also is very focused on the ongoing operations of the city. And so, to the extent that we're changing policy, you know, we need to be hearing from the public of what policies they want us to be changing. We need to get that in early because it may have an impact on, you know, people's jobs and all. And, you know, it, it just needs to come together much more on the front end than what happened this year, but this year was sort of the perfect storm of, you know, I'm not gonna say the, what I call 2020, but anyway, so. <laughs> uh, Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, Alex, anything to say sort of along the same lines? I know that uh, there's also every legislative session, uh, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of work that never gets done until the clock really starts ticking and it's coming up on, you know, sign die and sometimes they'll move the clock to buy them a little bit more time if they need to. Um, but what would you say about uh, making sure that people have access and know what's in the budget and how they can advocate, uh, hopefully well in advance of uh, last minute decisions? Yeah, so my, the way that I operate as a budget analyst um, is I start with agency board meetings. If there's an agency, like if you are passionate about, let's just use um, corrections, for example, um, then I'm gonna go to the Department of Corrections, I'm gonna get on their email list, I'm gonna find where on their website they put the board meeting dates, and I'm going to put those on my calendar. I'm gonna sign up which to go, because these are public meetings, or they're supposed to be public meetings, and I'm going to, listen in until I hear the budget update from the board of the agency, which is an early picture of what will be fed into the governor's budget request that eventually hits the legislature and then gets worked on. So that's kind of my process. Um, I focus really heavily on human services, so child welfare, workforce development, um, food stamps, uh, TANF, those programs. So I'm very in tune with that agency's board meetings um, most of the state agencies are governed by a board and they have to approve budget requests before they even go to the governor's office. So those are really great ways to get a sense of what, what's happening. Other than that, I'm shameless plug, GBPI, like we publish an annual budget primer every year. Um, it is a short reader on what is going to be included in the upcoming fiscal year's budget. Um, it is in print as well as digital online. I think we are trying to figure out what this next version is going to be. Um, every, in a traditional year, we publish on July 1, which is the literal day of the start date of the fiscal year. Um, but because of the un, unusual budget situation we've been in, we might be a little bit um, delayed. But you can go onto our website now and view primers from previous years that cover the major spending categories in Georgia. We also walk through the revenue picture for the state of Georgia um, and share state demographics and other things that people can follow along with really easily. And if you have feedback, if you do look at that and you have feedback on how we can be even more intuitive in the way that we deliver our budget information, please, please, please reach out to me or my colleagues and share. Because that is, I think, what we're learning in this process um, that is quite frankly not as democratic as it should be um, is that organizations like ours have to stand in the gap and like add some transparency to the process or else you'll wake up one day and you'll realize oh wait the whole public defender's budget just got cut <laughs> and so you know that stuff happens overnight um, and really fast so um, we want to add some transparency to it I want to say from a um, uh, 
I, I started looking at city budgets because of the whole police budget thing. And, um, recently, we posted on our website an uh, interactive tool where you can go through the most populous cities in the state of Georgia, and it's about 45, and um, look at how much that city spends on, on police from fiscal year 2020. So it would be the former um, fiscal year. And it includes some demographic information, et cetera. But as I was going through all of those cities' budgets, and there's over 500 in Georgia, so I only, you know, kept it kept the list short. Um, those budget documents are long, <laughs> and they are um, confusing. And the state's budget is is no different, right? But one state, one city, it was the city of Suwannee, and I sent this to a friend. They use open budget to provide transparency to their budget process and to the amount of dollars that they are spending. And I'm not sure, um, my understanding is that Atlanta, Jennifer, I don't know if they, I know they had one for spending for, yeah. Like, um, yeah. But for the budget, that is such, I, I'm blown away by that. If I can get, I may add this to my policy priorities for 2021. Like if I can get our legislature to implement an open budget or at least, you know, and this isn't an endorsement for that company because I know they, they want their money. Um, but if we could establish something like that, so that everybody has it, you know, in the in the palm of their hands when necessary at every stage of the process, then that would that would catapult, you know, Georgia much further in terms of its budget transparency and advocacy um, than where we are right now. Um, you know, all of the the documents live at the Office of Planning Budget, Planning and Budget for the state budget, <clears throat> um, and it's it's I'm going to be honest, it's difficult to to navigate the website. Um, and the different documents and you know they have to upload hundreds and hundreds of documents for a ton of members within the General Assembly and they have to see the documents first because they have to be able to read them in order to respond to their constituent questions about it so there's even a delay sometimes when a, a committee approves a budget and when it's actually in the hands of the public so um, yeah I have a lot of thoughts on um, in lessons learned from this previous or from this current uh, budget um, session from this legislative session that you know I might be throwing out there to the air to the wind um, a little bit on, but uh, GPPI is trying to be a much greater source for everybody. Um, we publish budget information really routinely throughout the year. Um, we have summaries in the early part of the legislative session, so as soon as the governor releases his budget request, we put out uh, blogs, short pieces, just summarizing what the governor's uh, priorities are. Um, and it culminates in that budget primer on, in July, whenever the new fiscal year starts. So um, soon we'll have that um, published. Um, I'm we, I'd probably get slapped on the hand, but please be on the lookout for that. Um, and, and again, let us know how we can be really helpful from this from the state level. I don't I don't envy y'all, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I will say for the people who live in the city of Atlanta who are listening, that actually is a great place. It's not, it's not 100% perfect, but it is, it's checkbook.atlantaga.gov and you can go see our spending. So if you want to go, you know, you can see the whole general fund budget and you can click into a department and then you can see within APD what goes to patrol officers, what goes to the chief's office, what goes to vehicles, and you can further check and in, click into that and see yeah, you know, deeper dive. So I think that's the first step in asking for a change, just knowing what's going on today yeah. and understanding our budget this year and then looking at it and saying, hey, you know, why do you guys need a helicopter? And then, you know, then you can ask that specific question at the meeting instead of just saying decrease police budget. You can say, well, gosh, I saw last year you spent this much on outside consulting services. What was that for and is that something you think you're going to need every year or could that money be repurposed so i i do think to the extent that i mean we listen to all public comment and i think sometimes it is the volume of even if it's a form letter or a form you know voicemail you know that's meaningful to me that we get this many that express this opinion and this many that express that opinion but to the extent that people um have some real specifics also that's really helpful to guide the conversation when people may say, you know, and I'm going to quit picking on um, police, they may say within the Department of Transportation, well, gosh, you spend this much money 
resurfacing roads, but you only spent this much money on sidewalks. So next year in your budget, can't we see, you know, those percentages flip? So um, I think that we need to continue to make that information accessible to the public so they, they know what we're doing and they know what questions to ask. Yeah, I believe at one time the city had an open budget tool, the uh, Atlanta Budget Explorer, but I'm not sure if that carried in over into the new administration or not. So I'm not sure that that is still up and running, but I think you can get some of that same functionality with the Atlanta checkbook. The checkbook. Um, because the checkbook, you could, you know, you could look up, what, was there a check written to Kyle Kessler, but you can also do this. There's um, not, just so everybody knows, there's no <laughs> checks written to Kyle Kessler. But you can also do this of taking the deeper dive into, um, into departmental spending. Gotcha. Um, well, this has been incredibly informative uh, for me, uh, both pulling together the presentation along with the SILE in this discussion. And uh, we'd love to, I think, sit on soapboxes the rest of the afternoon um, and discuss these things. But uh, I think it's, it's been incredibly helpful to me. Hopefully it's been to those uh, who are listening as well. And hopefully uh, those who have been listening have heard ways to engage and learn a little bit more about how they can get plugged in to these city processes. Uh, we will definitely provide contact information um, after the, the, this presentation is over. We'll send out the video. We'll have a summary uh, that our interns will be working on. Um, but any last comments on uh, what you might tell folks to, to do if they want to, you know, to, to show up and make their voice heard or things that uh, you think might be um, some hidden gems in this year's budget or things that, uh, that in spite of overall sort of revenue decline, some, some really sort of positives that have come out of some of the discussions we've had just in the past week um, regarding uh, trying to make numbers work, but also trying to sort of reflect um, the sort of passion that people have and trying to, to wrong these rights, that, to right these wrongs that have been part of our, uh, our government processes for so long. Yeah, I'll jump in and say, you know, repeat what I said before that in this strange distanced world that we're living in, um, it has been an upside that we have opened the door to make it a lot easier to participate in city government without having to take time off from work or school and come downtown. So I think we're going to have to figure out how we, what part of that we continue going forward because, I mean, we've got in the last week alone, we had 29 hours of public comment, I think, from people and, um, and just an overwhelming amount throughout the budget process. And it, and it did push some levers. I mean, there was at the beginning of the budget process, we really heard from people in the Sweet Auburn area um, and the east side of downtown of concern about closing the east side tad, that there were some very important community projects that needed to be done there, that they were afraid the funding wasn't going to, um, there wasn't going to be enough funding. And so that, that seems like a lifetime ago that we were working on that issue. But that, um, really was very much influenced. I mean, it turns out we felt we had the money, but putting that pressure on it and, and some people being very specific of this is a need in this community that we had, we're gonna rely on this funding for. Um, you know, we listened to that and we did that. The same thing with the Department of Corrections, instead of sort of putting a placeholder, instead of leaving it as the status quo and saying, oh, we'll get to it in the budget, there was a shift to, that's a little bit of a placeholder shift, but there still was that first step forward in moving it to constituent services. Um, and then I think those budget amendments that were made at the end were important. So, um, you know, I think a lot of that had to do with hearing people and hearing people in ways that we made available this year that we didn't, um, in the past, it was a little bit overwhelming, truthfully, to our um, city council staff to, deal with all of that. And so we've got to figure out what that, what the most efficient way looks like going forward. I will put in the two cents of the very most important person to reach out to is your own council member and the at-large members. Um, those are the people, I hate to say it, that in the political world, those are the voters that vote for you. And those are the people, you know, you're going to get their attention the most. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm always happy to hear what the voice of Atlanta and truthfully the state and across the nation, what the sentiment is. But um, I would, when you do reach out to your council members, you know, tell them your name, tell them that you live in their district and, um, and 
you you float to the top of the pile that way. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. There, anyway, it, it was clear during the public comment that uh, that there were some people who were trying to pull those levers and make sure that this is Kyle Kessler. I live in you know this yeah. district, and uh, I'm I'm speaking to you directly, not speaking generally to council, generally to the mayor, but. You know, my representative, I want to make sure you're hearing me because I, I have the power to vote. Right. I mean, it makes a difference. I mean, I know there was one woman that said she was calling from Australia, and that's interesting to hear somebody from Australia's perspective on the Atlanta City Council budget. But I think that it's much more meaningful for to hear Kyle Kessler's or one of, you know, my District 6 constituent views. And it also helps, I think, um, you know, they're, they're differing views even across our, you know, 500,000 people in the city. And so I think it's always interesting if people, and I know you all were collecting some data on that, identify um, where they, you know, if you don't want to say your name, say where you live in the city. And I think that that's helpful for us to get a sense of, it also helps give a sense of, well, people in this part of the city might be happy with the way we're doing something, yeah. but people three miles away are real unhappy with the same um, process that we're, you know, that it works here, but it doesn't work here. And that's good information for us to know. So anyway, it's, while it was an exhausting budget season, I think of having been in this strange posture really let us um, hear from the public in ways that we haven't in the past. No, I appreciate that. And uh, as Jennifer just mentioned, uh, the Center for Civil Innovation is working with Code for Atlanta to help process some of those uh, many, many, many hours of public <laughs> comment to see if we can pull some data out of that. Um, so the public can hear what the public had to say, but also yeah. so that our decision makers can, can hear where people were calling in and what they had to say and where those uh, sort of, uh, what those key points were because it, within 40 plus hours of comment, you might lose you know, the sort of unique sort of differences of what people yeah. had to express. One question uh, before we get to Alex, um, a question came up in the comment section and this was, I was curious about this as well. Last year, there was some money set aside in the city's budget for participatory budgeting. I mean, I know you had started a process uh, as well as uh, Amir Faroqi and, and um, Antonio Brown to, to do some participatory budgeting. Is, is there an allocation set aside in the FY 2021 budget or does that money that wasn't spent last year roll over into this next fiscal year? Yeah, and so what happened last year, that was fluid within the budget if there were some different proposals put forward. Um, what they ended up doing is allocating $50,000 to each council district as a pilot. And then Amir happened to have, Amir Farogi's district two rep, he had had some Renew Atlanta transportation money that he rolled into it and did a bigger participatory budget process there. So each council member had the 50000 I believe that Natalie Archibong from District 5 has made a decision about hers. I think maybe Mr. Brown has done his. I started the process and then truthfully got hung up and budget stuff. So the people who didn't spend it yet have that, we didn't have new money allocated, but that money will roll forward into this fiscal year and people will have the ability to do that. And I hope that that's something that in fiscal year 2020, 22, um, we can ask, we can allocate more and do that. I think it just, um, there was a suggestion by planning of how to run the process that council didn't like. And then by the time we got around to trying to figure out if we were going to do a uniform process or not, um, we just snowballed into all the other things that 2020 brought. So um, you can use I, that term I, for 2020 if you want now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think, I hope that we will, people will do that in the first half of this coming fiscal year of run their process, spend the money. We can collect some data, look and see if people liked that or not, what kind of projects they spend it on, and then be ready to request, a, you know, to, to allocate more money um, in that way for the budget for next year. Great. Now that, that sounds uh, like people definitely should be paying attention because those opportunities might come up in their district yeah. very soon. So, yeah. um, Alex, any last comments about uh, how people can get engaged beyond uh, what you already stated on your soapbox? Yeah. I, I mean, my, my biggest advice is to please get to know your lawmaker. Um, you know, they have much larger constituencies, obviously, um, but I think, you know, we're privileged if we live near the capital, if we're in the Atlanta region, where we can go to their offices when it's appropriate, again, obviously, um, and have a conversation with them, or just go to the Capitol building and sit in a committee meeting and introduce yourself that way. You don't have to be a registered lobbyist in order to, to do any of that. Um, and 
this, they don't operate like Congress, right? You know, this is a, a much more informal, well, it's formal, but you know, they're, they're closer to you um, than, than most folks think. And, you know, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is um, distinguishes between the state and like the city council is that my, you know, the city council is nonpartisan, <laughs> but state government is not. Um, the general assembly is not. Uh, it is a um, place where there is um, strong ideology represented and um, that is what creates um, a lot of different budget challenges and policy challenges, et cetera. Um, and that's, that's that on that point. But my point that I would like to make is that even then it's really important to make connections with people who historically don't work with you. You know, I used to think it's so cliche to say, oh, I work with people across the aisle or whatever. Um, and it is still kind of cliche to say that, but recognizing that there are folks within that general assembly who may represent you, who might have different opinions in you or different policy priorities in you, um, but are still willing to listen to you and hear you out can make a huge difference. Um, so establishing relationships with your lawmakers, you can go to, um, that General Assembly website, legis.ga.gov, and identify your lawmaker. You can also go to openstates.gov and identify your lawmaker there. Um, and just reach out, send an email to them directly or to the, and copy their staff, which is something I always do, and say, hey, I'd, I'd like to sit down and think about what are your priorities for next year? Like, you know, what are you looking for? Um, session will be new next year. Um, the caveat here is that this is an election cycle, so they, your member may or may not be there. <laughs> so look that up first. But um, um, or we'll I guess we'll TBD on that um, <laughs> for some folks. But that is one thing that I try to you know express to folks is that your state lawmaker is accessible. The process is you know accessible in terms of reaching the people. Um, and once you reach the, you can start picking apart kind of the mystery of it, you know, like, oh, I, like, I text a senator, you know, who I, you know, don't know, um, we're not family or friends or anything like that, but hey, like, I heard that there's a committee meeting today, can you confirm this or no? And they they got hundreds of constituents texting them, so they don't see if somebody has to respond to it or not. <laughs> they, just, they just answer the question sometimes. So stuff like that, it's, it's little things like that that really um, help you feel more included in the process, um, even though it's not designed to be totally um, transparent and accessible and democratic. So um, just, just get to know your life as much as you can um, uh, when possible. All right, well, thank you so much for spending uh, your afternoon with us virtually and going through uh, this fairly wonky, but hopefully uh, informative and helpful conversation. And. Uh, as Alex mentioned earlier, the General Assembly is in session right now, so uh, feel free to either physically go over there or email, contact them, um, watch live streams. I think they're streaming the meetings um, as well. Um, so there's still definitely a few hours left to, to have some influence there. But, but thank you to Jennifer um, for enduring hours and hours of public comments and additional <laughs> special call meetings and everything else. Um, and we appreciate you for your service. Um, if you'd like to support uh, Jennifer in the work, she does pay her taxes, um, and therefore we can pay the budgets. Um, uh, Alex uh, and GBPI, they're doing pretty awesome work, and thank you for that. So please visit their website to get more information and uh, find out how you can support their work. And uh, we will be making our information available. I think it's in the chat right now, but please go to civicatlanta.org and check us out on social media. Uh, we will be sharing this presentation, uh, the slides, as well as the, a recording of the video. Uh, but thank you once again for joining us, uh, panelists. Just so you know that when I when we end the meeting, it's going to end very abruptly. So it's not that we don't like you. That's just the way Zoom uh, kicks people out of the process. But uh, we will follow up later um, and make sure we can get any additional resources you want to get to to people who are uh, watching. Um, apparently, we'll all be rushing over to the Swanee uh, City website to check out how awesome their budget <laughs> is. But uh, thank you once again for joining us, uh, and uh, we hope you have a good weekend. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Alex.